Welcome to How to Split a Toaster, a divorce podcast about saving your relationships from True Story FM. Today, your toaster has your credit card. Do you know where it's spending? Welcome to the show, everybody. I'm Seth Nelson, and as always, I'm here with my good friend, Pete Wright. Financial strife is one of the key conflicts in a divorce. What happens when you try to separate yourself from a financially toxic relationship? This week on the show, we welcome Aviva Pinto, Managing Director and member of the Advisory Committee at Wellspire Advisors, to talk to us about financial infidelity from the money side and how you can take action on rebuilding your financial life after divorce. Aviva, welcome to the toaster. Thank you so much. Happy to be here. We're so provoked by this conversation around financial uh, infidelity and particularly from your perspective. Can you just I, I think I know what we're talking about with financial infidelity. I'm pretty sure I do. But I, I just so we're all on the same page. Talk to us. What is financial infidelity? What does it mean? What do you see? Financial infidelity can encompass a lot of things. Uh, one, you could be one person that is hiding money from another person. Like, for example, you're in a marriage for a long time and they are dissipating assets and have another family on the side. So money that should be going to the current family could be going to you know, a mistress, another family that somebody doesn't know about. That's the extreme. The non-extreme is if somebody is always spending and not telling the other person. So they're going out shopping all the time or they're going to fancy restaurants and things like that. And the credit card bills are piling up and up and up. And the other person is totally in the dark about that going on. That is also financial infidelity. And sometimes it can be as simple as you, you just get something and nobody knows that it is happening or it's coming from accounts that are unknown to the other person. So all of those can encompass financial infidelity in a relationship. How does it reach you at, at Wellspar in your role? Like, how are you, how is this all visible to you? What, what sort of work are you doing with people? Okay, so I'm a certified divorce financial analyst and I get involved in divorces in three stages. The first stage would be if somebody is contemplating a divorce. They think that something is going on, but they really don't know if it is. So they'll come to me and they'll say, you know, I, I think there's things happening in the accounts and I really don't know because I'm not the one that is managing the accounts and I'm not the one that's paying the bills. But when I go to do something, sometimes my credit card is being rejected or I, you know, looked up our credit score and, you know, we're in the 500s and we should be in the 800s because we're earning enough money. It's sometimes those types of things where the person that is the non-moneyed spouse or the one who's not paying the bills will see some kind of discrepancy and say, hey, you know, I think I should go talk to somebody. These are like the red flags. You're starting to see some red flags. Correct. It's Correct. not adding up. Okay. Right. It's making it's so, making my stomach hurt. Am I alone in that? Like all of this is is massively triggering. No, I think uh, Pete, I think that making your stomach hurt comes from you eating at fancy restaurants and maybe your wife doesn't know. <laughs> Oh, right. So. That's it. I see. I learned something every time we do this show. Or, or you're buying those fancy pants that are a little too tight. Right, <laughs> right, right. Wow. Aviv, my... Aviv is going straight to the wardrobe. That's it. She's really, she's, she's welcome here. Like she's in, in good company. Good company. So those those are the red flags when, you know, somebody is contemplating a divorce. I also get um, referrals from matrimonial attorneys, divorce coaches, therapists that say, hey, you know, this person doesn't know a lot about their finances. They're in a terrible relationship. They really need to get their things pulled together. And the first thing that they need to do when they file for divorce is do a statement of net worth. And sometimes the matrimonial attorney will take a look at it and say, wait, there's something going on here. You know, you guys are spending this lavish lifestyle and the tax return says that you're making a hundred thousand dollars a year. There's you know, where, where is this money coming from? So sometimes it's something where you need a forensic accountant to go in and say, Hey, well, you know, this person's got a cash business and not all the money is being reported to the IRS. So there's a whole different 
financial infidelity problem there because a lot of times they'll put the the tax return in front of the other person. I mean, right now is a perfect time to be doing that. Oh my God, it's due next week. Sign here. I got to get this in. Right. And the other without actually look, looking at it, Right, the other person doesn't look at it, doesn't know what's going on, you know, is signing off that they make one hundred thousand dollars a year. Yet, you know, they have a yacht or whatever That's so it is. Cagey. So, well, you know, I mean, divorce is not a pretty thing. Wait, Aviva, <laughs> I've got some questions and comments here. Hundred thousand dollars and they have a yacht. All well, right. So I know, think the no. question that comes to uh, mind is, is it a dinghy? What, what, like, <laughs> is it what, what are we yacht just... in name only? <laughs> yeah. Or maybe the yeah, dinghy so, is so. named yacht. That's the name of the boat is yacht. That's a dinghy. It's a, I, it's I a little, know. it's a little plastic toy you have in your bathtub. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's those types of things where, you know, you know that the person has a cash business, their lifestyle is way in excess of what they're reporting to the the IRS. And that's a huge red flag. And that's where you would get a forensic accountant involved in going and seeing, you know, what is the business? Where where are the trucks coming? Where are they going from? What's going on here? And, you know, how are you only reporting such a small amount of income? Um, I exaggerated terribly, but, you know, you get you get the picture. We, didn't, the- we, didn't, we didn't pick up on that exaggeration. <laughs> We're good. <laughs> we went right over our head. So what's, what's number three? What's the and third number one? Number three is when they come to me after after the divorce. And that's the worst time to come to me because usually they've signed off on their settlement. And at that point, it is too late. But that is where discrepancies can come in too. And I I think that the worst thing is that people who are blindly just signing off because they just want it to be over. They're in such a horrible relationship. The kids are a mess. They just want to get out of it. And so they'll do anything they can to just get out of it without realizing that what they're signing is going to affect the rest of their life financially. So those are the three times where I would get involved as a certified divorce financial analyst, helping the client figure out what's happening with the funds. Got a lot to unpack there, Pete. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm turning to you. I'm turning to you, buddy. Right, so you uh, in, in, I assume you're, it's not just turn to Seth to help people separate, but you're interwoven into this whole process in, in cases of financial infidelity. It's an absolute team process. I mean, I work with the person's accountant. I work with the person's matrimonial attorney. I work with the person's therapist because, you know, a lot of times it's like they don't want to talk about these things. They are, um, they're it's embarrassed. Hard, it's hard to talk to your friends and say, oh, by the way, I'm broke. <laughs> that right. and the and then the other thing is that a lot of them are em- embarrassed because they don't have financial literacy, and then they're kicking themselves that why you know why did I let this go on so long without taking a look at what was going on in our accounts, and so that's another thing where there's a little bit of shame, that where they don't want to admit that they didn't see it or didn't know it because a lot of times it's professionals who you know they could be lawyers, they could be doctors, they could be you know judges. And they just have delegated the other part of the relationship to the other spouse. And because they delegated it, they're like, you know, honey, I don't really want to figure out what's going on with the pipes. So why don't you fix the pipes? Right. And it's the same thing with with the finances. It's like, you know, you're the one who's paying the bills. You're the one who's doing all that. I'm going to take care of these things in the family. And so it's really just a division of responsibilities. But if you're not in involved, you're the one at a disadvantage when something in the marriage breaks up. According to the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, approximately 10% of children live with a parent with an alcohol use disorder. This is an alarming statistic as a family law professional who deals with custody cases regularly. Finding the balance between the child's safety and helping the child maintain a relationship with both parents is one of the hardest things to navigate. Add in the he said, she said phenomenon that happens with divorcing couples who often weaponize alcohol use against one another, and the situation is even more difficult. All of this is why Soberlink has been one of the most important tools for my clients dealing with these issues. Soberlink's remote alcohol monitoring tool has helped over 500,000 people prove their sobriety and provide peace of mind regarding the child's safety. 
Soberlink helps keep the focus on the best interest of the child, which is really the most important part in a divorce case dealing with children. I've teamed up with Soberlink to create a parenting plan guide to help people going through divorce that involves alcohol in children. And you can download it today at Soberlink.com slash toaster. And if you take a look and you think you're ready to order Soberlink, just mention how to split a toaster for $50 off their device price. Our thanks to Soberlink for sponsoring How to Split a Toaster. So let's let's kind of talk about the three stages. Um, Pete, when someone's contemplating, the good news, the way Aviva's laid it out, is they're seeing some red flags. So they might be financially illiterate, which is not a derogatory term. It means you just haven't focused on it and you can absolutely learn it. We've had shows on that more than once, Pete, that these are all learned skills. Um, but when you're doing that part, the good, good news is, your blinders are off. You're like, okay, something's going on here. It doesn't feel right. There's some smoke here. Let me get to some professionals to try to understand and see if we can uncover what's going on. There's really two types of things to be aware of when you're at that stage is one, does your spouse have a business where they are, uh, uh, whether it's, they're a plumber, uh, an accountant, a lawyer, whatever they may be. Do they own their own business, a sandwich shop? It doesn't matter. But anywhere where they own their own business, that is right for ways for that person who's the owner of the business to play financial games, I'll call it. Okay? Because maybe they're deducting stuff that they've got the business credit card that they're using on the side that you never see at home. And they're, they're really personal expenses for the other family or the person that um, they shouldn't be hanging out with and all this other money going out there if they're having an affair that you just don't see on your personal credit cards. And it's not just an affair. It could also be, you know, drugs, alcohol, gambling. Exactly. You just don't know, right? So the good news about the contemplating is you're catching it early. And it might be late in like, oh my God, this has been going on for years. But when you're preparing for a divorce, that's on the early side. Now, the thing to other be aware of is if someone's a W-2 employee, they don't own their own business, they get a paycheck from somebody, it's really easy in the divorce process to find out whether that paycheck is going where it's supposed to go, so to speak, because it's going to have a direct deposit. And then all of a sudden, you're like, well, wait a minute. Why is half of it going somewhere else, right? But you're tracing that money. And that's what we've talked about. We've had forensic accountants on the show before where they trace the money, right? And the third part, which I would really like to talk about, which is the worst time to figure this all out. But I think we have to have this main conversation today, Aviva, is the divorce is over. And and they've made a deal. It might have been a financially bad deal, which people are allowed to make, but there would have also been potentially very good reasons to make a financially bad deal, i.e., I was done. Maybe I lost $100,000 that I could have gotten, but I didn't have to pay the lawyer fees. So maybe it wasn't going to be a hundred grand after all. Maybe I got the children on the time-sharing plan or the custody and visitation plan that I wanted that I thought was best. So there's a lot of other reasons to make a financially bad deal. And there's a whole lot more to divorce than just the money. But someone comes to you and they need to rebuild their financial picture. What does that look like? That sometimes doesn't look very happy. What you're looking at is debt, There's credit card debt that maybe the other person wasn't aware of and maybe didn't get into the divorce stipulation that you find out about it later when you're looking at the credit and you decide, okay, now I need to get a new house or I need to rent an apartment and or I need a credit card in my own name. And all of a sudden, nobody is willing to give you credit because of the terrible credit that you had as a partnership in the past. So the first thing that I tell these clients to do is we've got to fix that. You've got to pay off all the debt. 
You've got to get your credit score up. And sometimes it takes as long as six months. And so if they're looking to buy a house or something like that, it needs to be done with cash if they're going to do that, because there's no bank or, you know, even even the loan sharks are not going to give it to you if you've got, you know, a terrible credit rating. Let's just say so, we now have it in canon that loan shark <laughs> is an option for divorce finance yeah. rehabilitation. Yeah. I think it might be at the bottom of the list, but it's on the list now. I never would have expected that. Right. Right. On the and advice I mean, of counsel, do not call Guido. <laughs> Okay. Better not call Saul. Okay. Here we go. I think we're going to edit that part out. Right. <laughs> this oh, is gold. Whenever, wow. Aviva, whenever you say that, Andy, our producer, puts that at the <laughs> top of the show. In, right? That's right. It's, that's uh, the, that's the clip the for headline. Instagram. <laughs> yeah. Aviva, Pinto for, Aviva Pinto from Wellspire is recommending Lo- Loan Sharks, sharks. viable alternative. <laughs> Uh, but in any case, I mean, you know, when you, when you have to fix your credit score and you have to get your credit back on track, that is really the first thing that you need to do to get started. And, you know, they come to me after the divorce. And the first thing is, you know, I need to start saving for my kids college if they didn't have a 529 plan set up or I need to save so that I could, you know, afford a house down the road or whatever. And the first thing that we do is we look at their budget and we say, OK, OK, you know, how much are you spending? What does your lifestyle look like? And then we look at their resources and what are what's out there in the asset column and what's the liabilities. And that's sometimes where you find, you know, the, the credit score that's terrible or they don't have a lot to their name and they have to start over. So I've got a question about paying off credit cards. Sure. I have this philosophical debate um, with my clients all the time. where my kind of financial brain says pay off the higher credit card interest first. Yes. So let's say you have one that's a thousand dollars. It's got a 20% interest rate, but you've got another credit card. I'm just using easy math, 200 bucks on that. And it's got a 5% rate, but God, it would feel so good to pay off that one credit card, 200 bucks and just be done with it. Right. In that emotional aspect of I'm only down to four credit cards. Let's say they've got a couple others out there, but financially you're better off taking that 200 and you put it towards the high interest rate. But I appreciate the emotional aspect of being done with one card, though financially you're going to end up paying a little more. So, so there are these little metal things called scissors and I love using them. When clients come in, we open their wallet and I cut up as many cards as I can possibly get my hands on because emotionally, yes, you'll pay off that $200, but you can never put anything more on that card if it's already been cut up. Until she realizes it's on their phone and they just tap. (laughs) (laughs) So I get out my hammer and I take their phone and I smash the living hell out of it. Throw it out the window. You know, you're great. But, you know, if you look at the math, 20 percent on a credit card, you know, if I'm investing for a client over over a 10 year time period, if equities are only going to return you about 8 percent. And that's not every single year. I mean, there are some years where it's going to do great, like last year. There are other years like this year where the market is down. But on average, you're going to be looking at, you know, six to eight percent or so from stocks in a portfolio. Okay. I'm not right. talking about bonds right now, so but just stocks. You're, so you're telling us what pay I'm off telling the you is one. pay off the $1,000 one <laughs> okay. because you're being charged 20%. And that is highway robbery. So what I do with our clients is we take a look at everything that they owe and how much they're being charged. And we put together a schedule and this is, you know, and if you can consolidate the debt, together so that it makes them feel better. Okay. Everything's in one place. I'm going to pay it off in one, in one fell swoop over time, et cetera. And you give them the roadmap. It makes them feel better about their accomplishing something, but cutting up those cards, you know, and I don't know, deleting the app. I'm not quite sure what, what okay. we have so, to do there. Uh, all right. So stop, stop spending, right? Just st- stop spending indiscriminately and cut up, pay, get off those high interest rates. I want to talk about the credit r- score though, because that is a thing 
thing that really can bite people. And it seems like there's just some some black arts arcana that goes into defining what a credit score would be. How do you rebuild after your credit is damaged as a result of someone else's you know, financial infidelity. Well, as you will hear from matrimonial attorneys, regardless of whose debt it was, it is still your responsibility unless it says in the divorce stipulation that the other person is going to pay off all of those debts. But that still doesn't help your credit score because your name is still on that joint account. So the first thing you do is you cut off all the joint accounts. You just close every single account that has your name on it. You open new accounts if you can. And if you can't, then debit cards are the way to go. Go to the bank, get yourself some money, put it on the debit card. And then if you need to charge things or whatever it is where you don't want to carry around a lot of cash, just use the debit card. But Pete, Pete, to your point, though, right, is when you're setting up the divorce on the financial matters, I will always recommend to my clients one that you are going to take the debt that is in your name because we're not going to trust the other side to pay it so you want to be responsible for anything that's in your name or if let's say hypothetically you're selling the house at closing of the house there's an agreement to pay off all the cards directly Okay. Okay. So there's ways to immediately, if possible, if there's the cash flow, to wipe that stuff out. The sooner, the better. Um, but I will never want to leave a credit card that is in my client's name with the other party to pay, okay. because that's going to right. ding your credit. So you want to you want to have control, right? You want to have control of your finances and control that includes control of your debt. So then you just start attacking them one at a time. You make the minimum payments on all of them. And if you have an extra 50 bucks, you put it towards the high interest rate. So let's say you're paying that card at $100 a month. When it gets paid off, you take that $100 you were paying and you put it towards another card along with the minimum. And when you pay that one off, now you're paying 150 towards the other one. And you will feel very good when it dramatically starts going down and down and down. And as you well put, Pete, stop the spending. We appreciate in this show We're saying things that sound easy, but it's hard when your kids need the cleats for soccer. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But we can change our standard of living and understand that you might have a lower standard of living. You might be watching your money more, but ultimately that will lead to a much higher standard of living down the road because you keep doing it now. You're never going to get there. I want to shout out a a, I've got to shout out a product. Uh, it, for those who struggle, uh, check out YNAB. You need a budget. I've got friends over at YNAB. It is an incredible service for helping it specifically this. You feel like you don't have a, a sense for your money, how it works. Uh, YNAB is transformational for so many people who go from having, you know, $50 in the bank living from paycheck to paycheck to having thousands of dollars in a very short amount of time. It is incredibly powerful. So I, YNAB will put a link in the show notes if you haven't checked it out and you're struggling with money it's incredible uh and they're not even yet a sponsor of the show we need to make some calls uh i, I want to ask though about the credit like once you make all these decisions my first question was does use uh, does rational and sane use of a debit card help you rebuild credit in any way and how long can you expect it to take to rebuild credit whatever that means whatever the, I, I don't even you might have to set a goal for me what is a rational goal for for actually how will you know you've done it you know the first thing that you can do is it, it depends on how much money you have so let's say you've gotten your settlement and it's a good settlement and you've got extra money the first thing you do is pay off all those cards all right sure. and then cards are gone then you start looking at what else, you know, have we paid the mortgage on time, you know, or is there a problem out there? So you run the credit report and it shows you where the issues are and you immediately get in touch with those companies where you have the outstanding balances, you pay those off, you get them to tell the credit companies that that you have paid them off. And so the score starts changing immediately once those happen. Now, it could take a total of about six months in the worst case, 
But if you do that systematically and get the credit card companies and the other debtors to tell the rating agencies that you're doing this and you've got it all paid off, your score can increase dramatically very quickly. That seems like uh, great news. <laughs> that seems like great news. Can you address do, yeah, do little things like this? Pay them on time. This is what that actually gets to. I, I want to have a, an authorized uh, representative of money uh, answer this question for me. Is it a good idea to uh, make sure that you have a credit card and that you use it and pay it on time in order to help you rebuild your credit? Absolutely. Absolutely. If you can get one. But the problem is, if you have a really bad credit score, there are very few companies that are going to give you you know, a, a credit card. The easiest ones to get are gas cards. But I guess with the price of gas these days, it's even harder to pay those off quickly. Right, right. Uh, no, no joke. Uh, but, it, you know, the, we, the, we the laugh gas because we are not crying. Right. <laughs> it's, exactly. Yeah. Um, but there are some companies that will let you prepay credit cards and students can come out of school and get, you know, if you show that they've got a, uh, a job offer. You know, there are credit card companies that'll do that. And if you've written to the credit card company or spoken to a rep on the phone and say, hey, look, I just went through a divorce. This is what's going on. I need a credit card. And sometimes, you know, you can work out that you can prepay and they will give you the credit card because they've already got your money. So there's that way around it as well. Um, Seth, anything else we need to throw in here? Any other legal recourse you have in the post-divorce, like rehabilitative uh, portion of you our know, credit um, discussion? It just ears went up um, when Aviva was talking about, hey, the spouse is coming in and saying, we got to get our taxes filed, sign here. Right? And they own their own business. You don't pay attention. Um if there was fraud or something wrong or that tax return was not done properly and you and your spouse get audited years later because of the uh, filing and the IRS does an audit, which is, you know, a ton of fun, Pete, you should, yeah, you know, it's a thrill. you should, yeah. you should volunteer for that one day, <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> um, and you just say, look, I didn't know. There's, there's this innocent spouse doctrine within the IRS code, which is really, um, if you're going through an audit or something of that nature, you need to talk to your legal advisor about, I'm not going to get into it uh, in detail today, but basically it's saying, I really didn't know. It can be a difficult battle to wage, but you definitely have to talk to your uh, advisor or your legal advisor or your accountant about what that means. So don't feel like you have no avenue to uh, fight that, but it could be a rough road. So I just want to kind of put a little pin in that, let people know it, it's out there. Well, it sounds like uh, 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 all these avenues hinge on going from uh, the darkness of secrecy and financial infidelity and lies to honesty and like just authenticity and here's and, and just present the facts as they are. And and that's the only way you're going to rebuild. I think the thing that I get out of this is just start running that run that credit report and use that as a checklist of things to resolve quickly as quickly as you possibly can. Uh, but telling the truth to every one of these organizations, agencies, debt holders probably makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Absolutely. And sometimes, you know, they can talk to them and get some kind of um, remediation. You know, maybe you don't have to pay the whole thing or they give you longer time to pay it and they'll adjust your credit card while credit score while you're doing the remediation with them. And, and along with that, when you're talking about paying stuff off down the road, post divorce, we haven't mentioned it today, but what happens if you're receiving alimony? So the challenge there is everyone's like, well, if I just get the alimony, I can pay off the debt, right? But there's an assumption there that you're going to get the alimony payment. So when you're working with your attorney and your financial planner or your forensic accountant, and you're talking about how to do a divorce settlement, now look, it takes two, maybe the court wouldn't allow you to do this. But when you're looking at all these different issues, maybe it's better to take less alimony as long as you confirm right away that the debt will get paid off immediately. Right. Take a lump sum payment. Take a lump sum payment or instead of getting, I'm making up numbers. Instead of getting $5,000 a month, you'll take 3000 
but immediately there's a cash account that we want these credit cards paid off for. And we're going to treat that as a prepayment of alimony, but the cards get paid off right away. And it's all done right away. And and you have control of that. Or maybe you take a little less retirement, which I know for an, or, um, financial planners cringe at, but you take a little <laughs> less retirement. She's like, Aviva's like break out <laughs> the hives over I think, there. I think she's quivering uh, right uh, now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, but that's long-term thinking that, because look, you need money now, you'll need money in retirement. But sometimes it, it just feels better. We're wiping the plate clean. I'm starting fresh. I don't have as much as retirement. It will grow over time. I'm only in my 30s or 40s, not in my 60s. So maybe I have the time to build it. See, I'm making Aviva feel better because I gave more time for growth from <laughs> the retirement. You know, <laughs> But that's how you kind of can work those different scenarios. And, and then you're not dragging on on the legal issues over and over. He's not paying or she's not paying the alimony. I got to go back to court. Fun time. I got to pay the attorneys. And, and so you can think that through. And the other thing you can do is you can do a financial plan where it takes a look at the various options. So what is the present value of getting the lump sum now versus the future value of getting the alimony? And what is the uh, present value of my retirement account versus taking it out of, you know, the, the savings, et cetera. And so you can do that cost basis analysis and see the best way to go. So okay. Hold on though, Aviva. You just made that sound easy. Yeah. So here's the struggle. <laughs> like I'm I'm just gonna take the present value of your alimony that you get paid out over 10 years and you're getting five hundred dollars a month and it's sixty thousand dollars or six thousand dollars a year and let's do it by 10 that's sixty thousand dollars do the present value. Okay. So what I think of even saying, Pete, is that, look, if you're going to get an alimony for 10 years, I'm making up a number to make it easy. You're going to get $100,000, right? What is that money worth today? That's what the present value calculation is, because what you're looking at is, you know, what you get today is going to be worth a lot more than what you're going to get five years down the road because of inflation. And as you know, inflation is going up. Um, you know, we used to put 2.1% as our uh, estimate for inflation in all of our financial plans, and now we're putting 2.5%. So, you know, there's an expectation that inflation is going to be higher going forward. And so anything that you're buying today is going to cost you more tomorrow. You've seen it in the grocery stores. You've seen it with your gasoline prices every time you fill up your car. And so it is, even though you look at it and you say, well, you know, I'm only getting $10,000 of this $100,000 this year over the next 10 years. If I take the $100,000 right now, it would be worth more to me than if I took $10,000 each year for 10 years, because those $10,000 every year is not adjusted for inflation. So basically what you're doing is you're looking at what's it worth today versus what it would be worth in the future. And you look at present value. And there's a lot of assumptions on that number. What's your rate of return, all this stuff. But my point is this, some people that are listening to this is like, well, wait a minute. I'm financially illiterate. I know Seth is telling me and Pete's telling me and Aviva's is telling me I can learn it. But I'm a little nervous about getting a hundred grand today because I don't want to blow it. I don't, and I'm going to need this over the next 10 years. Maybe it's better to get a little bit over time so I can learn this along the way, which is certainly a reasonable approach. There's assumptions there. One is that you're actually going to get the payments over time. And two, that you understand it might not be worth more, you know, if you get $10 or $100 or $60 today and it can fill up your tank, it's not going to fill up your tank five years from now because gas will go up. There's all these assumptions built in. But part of dealing with money is how are you emotionally tied to it? Does it make you nervous? Are you not sure? So you have to think about the, the psychological aspects of what makes you more comfortable and that may or may not conflict with what's best financially for you if you're just running the numbers. And that struggle can be hard. And that's where the teaching comes. And that's where you want to become literate. And because then you'll get more comfortable with these decisions. 
And that's why it takes a team because, you know, you've, you've got your matrimonial attorney that's dealing with the legal aspects of the separation, but divorce comes down to two things. One is custody and one is money. So if you have a financial person that's part of your team and on your side, they can help you get up that learning curve and understand it a lot faster than if you're just going it on your own. I just like that Aviva calls us the matrimonial attorneys. I, I just... I know it's so classy. Yeah. Is that like I, way too classy for this crew, right? On this podcast, right? right? I mean, like, literally, way it's out like, classy. I'm a divorce attorney. <laughs> and people are like, oh my God. Right. You know, and yeah. she makes it sound so nice. She does. She makes it sound so nice. Well, and I just want to remind people that they, just because, it, you know, we're talking about present value of money, <laughs> present value of debt is the other thing. If you haven't gotten your nice emails from your credit uh, holder saying, hey, uh, the interest rate's going up. Don't don't worry. We'll be fine. But we're going to be charging you more each month uh, for the debt that you hold with us. Remember that, too, that uh, uh, debt is getting only more expensive right now. Aviva? Thank you. You're you're a class act. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> it's great to be on. Tell us, uh, tell us a little bit about where people can find out what you do. So um, I am at Aviva A V I V A dot Pinto P I N T O at Wealthspire W E A L T H S P I R E dot com, and our website is www.wealthspire.com. You can also look at, for me on LinkedIn. And uh, just do a Google search and you'll come up with a lot of uh, information that I've put out there. So where are you now? And do you work locally or, or all over the country? What's your scope there? We are a national firm. We're a registered investment advisory firm. We have $20 billion under management. I am based in the New York office and we, you know, remote into wherever anybody's dining room, living room, kitchen is, and we can help them wherever they are. We also have international clients, so it uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, I do work with local uh, matrimonial attorneys. Each person has to have their, or I'll call them divorce attorney, whatever nice. you like to be called. Now we're talking. <laughs> Strike now zone. we're talking. Strike zone. <laughs> I do work with uh, div- divorce attorneys um, across the country. Everybody, as you know, everybody has to have somebody who is from their state, so that they are filing in every law, every state, and and even you know within states there are various different uh, laws and jurisdictions. So very important to have them be local to the area. But I can do the financial part of it nationally. That's perfect. Thank you so much for being here for helping folks, and we'll put all the links everybody in the show notes. Thank you for downloading and listening to this show. We appreciate you being a regular subscriber. On behalf of Aviva Pinto and Seth Nelson, America's favorite divorce attorney, I'm Pete Wright, and we'll catch you next week right here on How to Split a Toaster, a divorce podcast about saving your relationships. Seth Nelson is an attorney with Nelson Coster Family Law and Mediation with offices in Tampa, Florida. While we may be discussing family law topics, how to split a toaster is not intended to, nor is it providing legal advice. Every situation is different. If you have specific questions regarding your situation, please seek your own legal counsel with an attorney licensed to practice law in your jurisdiction. Pete Wright is not an attorney or employee of Nelson Coster. Seth Nelson is licensed to practice law in Florida.